So good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, for your very kind introduction. And thank you, Mark, and you all for having me with you uh, this evening here at the Meadows. It's, it's always a treat to be here, especially for an expert in, in Spanish art like me. And the timing, as Amanda said, is also quite perfect, as I just opened uh, last October in Paris, a show on El Greco, while the Meadows had opened its highlights from the Bose Museum show using El Greco, El Greco Saint Peter for the signature image. Very good choice, by the way. In fact, El Greco and Dallas is an old story that started almost 40 years ago when the fondly remembered Bill Jordan did the El Greco of Toledo exhibition at the DMA. The catalog of my El Greco exhibition in Paris is dedicated to his memory. So from Texas to Texas, the loop is closed. But El Greco then. The story of El Greco is first of all the story of a destiny. The destiny of a man who changed life after he had already become a renowned Byzantine painter in Crete, where he was born around 5041. And in 5066, indeed, he decided to move on and went to Venice to convert to Western art. No doubt, he already knew about the Serenissima when still living and walking in his native Heraclion. Crete was, in fact, a Venetian dominion at the time, and European paintings and prints made an easy way to this Greek island that had somehow become a provincial Venetian territory. But Venice would not be the end of his journey, nor would be Rome, where he moved around 1570, or Madrid, where at some point he tried to find himself a position at the court. It is Toledo where he found his place and definitely settled in the 5080s. He was 40 years old already and rich of many experiences and multiple cultures. This is therefore the superposition of cultures, influences, ambitions and frustrations that made El Greco what he was and still is. And that's what I'd like to discuss with you this evening. The city El Greco discovered when he arrived in Venice around 1566 was not very different from this view Gentile Bellini depicted at the beginning of the century. Speaking of the architecture, obviously not of the swimming monks in the, in the canal. <laughs> who, who knows? Venice was a great place for the arts. Titian was still alive, and Veronese and Tintoretto were intensively active at the time, not to mention the other many painters walking in those giants' shadow. El Greco, for his part, uh, was far to be a competitive rival yet. His first style was pretty much hybrid, putting together his icon painter technique with inventions coming from uh, Italian prints. The adoration of the king from the Benaki Museum that you see here is a perfect example of it. Look how he reused the figure of a soldier from an engraving after Parmigianino. But very few years later, perhaps two, he was already able to paint the same subject but in, in a totally Venetian manner, proving what a quick learner he was. How did he do it? By copying and imitating the Venetian masters, starting with Titian and his great sense of color. Veronese and his lavish and elegant compositions. Tintoretto with his dramatic use of space, light, and movements. So that, around 5070, El Greco had become a true Renaissance painter. I show here one of his most achieved paintings of that time for its sense of space and color, its, its mastery of perspective, and its dynamic articulations of interacting figures. Venice was not meant to be El Greco's hometown, though. The city was far too small for far too uh, many great talents, and El Greco had no strong network of patrons. Then he decided, therefore, to move to another major artistic place, Rome, then not less than the capital of the Western art world. There, he would enjoy the support of one of the most powerful patrons in Italy, the Cardinal Farnese, nephew of Pope Paul III. 
Cardinal Farnese welcomed El Greco in his palace, the most beautiful private house in Rome in, 70, uh, in 1570. All of his had, in, had been arranged by a great friend of El Greco and an artist entrusted by the cardinal for whom he painted a famous illuminated manuscript known today as the Farnese Hours and held at the Morgan Library in New York. You see it on this portrait uh, El Greco painted of, the, of this precious friend, Giulio Clovio, uh, holding the famous uh, book. Uh, this painting ended up in the Farnese collection and became therefore part of the Capo di Monte Museum since the 18th uh, century. But being at the, pan, uh, the Palazzo Farnese immensely favored uh, El Greco, giving him access to one of the most intellectual circles in Europe, a humanist library of almost incomparable richness, one of the greatest collection of antiquities and paintings by the most renowned artists, starting with Michelangelo, who had designed the facade of the palace. The fascination for antiquity was unavoidable feelings for artists of this time, and even El Greco, who actually considered himself as a Greek to be the legitimate heir of the ancients, couldn't resist to classical art. One can see that in the Minneapolis version of the purification of the temple, for instance, where the artist quoted several of the most famous classical sculptures from the Vatican collections. The Sleeping Ariane, uh, here, you have it here. Um, so the, yeah, the Sleeping Ariane, the, yeah, that's from the Laocon. Well, the back side and front side for this figure. And this temple that you can see here, that got destroyed very few years after uh, El Greco's departure uh, from, uh, from Rome. Together with the ancient world, Michelangelo drew most of El Greco's attention. The great master had died a few years before El Greco's arrival, but his art was still reigning in the papal city, embodied by his great achievement in the Sistine Chapel. But, boldly enough, El Greco didn't consider Michelangelo a good painter. Can you imagine that? An opinion that he would eventually express too openly and too publicly, being consequently forced to leave the Farnese Palace after the cardinal, main patron of the late Michelangelo, felt offended. On the contrary, as a sculptor, Michelangelo pleased and did interest El Greco, who reused the invention of the Pieta Bandini, now in Florence, but then in Rome, in two paintings dating from his Italian period, the Philadelphia Johnson Pieta and the recently discovered entombment, now part of the Alana collection. El Greco was not the only one to emulate Michelangelo. In fact, he was active in a very competitive market of small devotional pictures inspired by the great Florentine master's inventions. His main rival was Marcello Venusti, who had direct access to Michelangelo's drawing and copied them in painting, only adding color. It was but far from the ideas El Greco had about painting. For him, faithful to the Venetian school, the color and the paintbrush were most important and should never surrender to the cold lines of drawings. But well, chased out from uh, the Farnese Palace, El Greco found himself networkless again and again decided to move to another place, Toledo, and this would be the one. Rome was not all bad memories for El Greco though. There he met with Luis de Castilla, with Father Diego was a very influential priest in Toledo. Probably Luis uh, told his Greek friend that his father would help him out with commissions in Spain. Also, El Greco knew about King Philip II being a great admirer of Venetian painting. He also knew that the Spanish monarch was looking for talents to add on the large uh, basilica and the many chapels and rooms of his new palace and monastery at El Escorial in the outskirts of Madrid. What is certain is that Luis kept his word and no later than 1577, his father commissioned from El Greco an imposing painting, the disrobing of Christ, the expolio in Spanish, for one 
uh, of the most prestigious spaces in Toledo, the chapter sacristy uh, in the cathedral. Actually, Don Diego gave him another opportunity to shine by showing the extent of his talent, asking him to take over the internal decoration of the church of the convent of Santo Domingo and Antigo, still in Toledo. The centerpiece of this commission consisted in a large altarpiece dedicated to the Assumption of the Virgin, surmounted by the Holy Trinity and flanked by the figures of the two St. Johns. El Greco not only painted the different canvases, he also designed the architecture and the sculptures. Dismantled during the 19th century, the Assumption joined in uh, 1906 the Art Institute in Chicago and is at the moment, for the Parisians' great pleasure, the center of the show in Paris. The third major commission El Greco got during his first years in Spain was for the Escorial. It's actually not clear whether it was the king's or the artist's own initiative. The painting that bears the romanticized title of the dream of Philip II represents the Spanish monarch surrounded by the Pope, the Doge, a cardinal, and some other military men, all kneeling and worshiping the miraculous vision of Jesus' monogram and the celestial, uh, I mean, with the celestial court, obviously. While in the left background, the souls are waiting for salvation, sorry, in the left background, sorry, are, are waiting for salvation. On the right, the damned are being eaten by an infernal whale-like monster or, hung over, or hung over a sea of, uh, of lava. The king, who was a great admirer of Venetian art, must have been pleased by the picture. In fact, he immediately commissioned one more to the artist, a larger one, intended to take place in the Escorial Basilica. He had to deal with the, with the representation of the martyrdom of St. Maurice. And El Greco prob probably felt very confident after his first successes, but he actually did not understand uh, what the king had in mind for his sanctuary. Therefore, he painted a very sophisticated composition whose iconography was not that much the proper sacrifice of the saint relegated in the background than the discussion between the general and his men convincing them to welcome death. In short, while the king was expecting a very clear image supporting the believer's devotion by showing a cruel, bloody slaughter, El Greco painted a humanist representation, exemplifi exemplifying the force of rhetoric and persuasive speeches. The king want wanted action, the artist gave him chattery. That was the end of it. Philip II commissioned the final work from another painter, an Italian one, Romulo Cincinnati. And El Greco did not get any other opportunity to work for the royal patron. What was certainly a hard blow and a final stop for El Greco as a court painter did not dim his career in Toledo. Um, Toledo at the time was a much more powerful, rich and influential city than Madrid was in fact. Short after the St. Maurice failure, El Greco was to paint his most ambitious, ambitious composition and by all means his most famous ever since the burial of the Count of Orgas. No picture better demonstrates the essence of El Greco's art. It was painted for his own parish church, Santo Tomé, and the contract for the painting is, died, is dated in March 1586. El Greco agreed to finish the painting by Christmas of the same year. The picture illustrates a popular local legend. In 1312, a certain Don Gonzalo Ruiz native of Toledo and senior of the town of Orgas, died. He was a pious man who, among other acts of charity, left, had left money for the enlargement and adornment of the church of Santo Tomé. At his burial, Saint Stephen and Saint Augustine miraculously appeared and intervened to lay him to rest. 
The most striking aspect of the composition is the juxtaposition of the imaginative vision of heaven with the burial scene, in which all the figures are dressed in contemporary costumes and presumably represent distinguished citizens of El Greco's Toledo. The dichotomy in, the sty in style between the upper and lower parts is one of the most remarkable features of the painting. In the lower zone, El Greco meticulously reproduces the appearances of persons and objects. The heavenly scene, by contrast, is far more abstracted. This peculiar synthesis uh, of real and superreal is essential to El Greco's art. The painting remains in the chapel, the actual scene of the event, for which it was ordered. Already in 1588, people flocked to see it. The immediate popular reception depended, however, on the, on the lifelike portrayal of the no, notable men of Toledo of the time. Indeed, this painting, sorry, I go back to that, to that. Indeed, this painting is, sufficiently, is sufficient to rank El Greco among the few greatest portrait painters ever. Nowadays, the painting can communicate to us a world society, an age, as perhaps no other single work of art can, and at the same time offers us one of the great marvels of painting. This is the first completely personal work by the artist. There are no longer any references to Roman or Venetian formulas or motives. He has succeeded in eliminating any description of space. There is no ground, no horizon, no sky, and no perspective. Accordingly, there is no conflict, and a convincing expression of a supernatural space is achieved. This is the beginning of El Greco's real development. The process of dematerialization and spiritualization has begun. The next stage in El Greco's career, as well as in his stylistic evolution, is the even more impressive commission um, he received from a church in Madrid, the Colegio de Dona Maria de Aragon. The official name of uh, the institution was Colegio de Nuestra Señora de la Encarnación, College of Our Lady of the Incarnation. It was an Augustian seminary in Madrid for the training of priests. The construction, the construction of the church began in 1581, and El Greco, who was resident in Toledo and had relatively few contacts in Madrid, was fortunate to obtain the contract for the main altarpiece. The agreement between the painter and the Council of Castile was signed in December 1596, so 10 years after the commission of the, of the Count of Orgas, and required El Greco to deliver the altarpiece, including carpentry, sculptures, and gilding. Uh, sorry, by Christmas, uh, he had to finish that by Christmas uh, 1599. But as often, the altarpiece was only completed in July uh, 1600. El Greco was not very reliable about uh, timing. The Doña Maria de Aragon altarpiece was the most important commission El Greco received, and he was paid just under 6,000 ducats for it, a vast sum, sum that more, uh, and more than he earned for any other work he did. The altarpiece was dismantled in 1910, 1810, following the suppression by Joseph Bonaparte of the religious orders in Spain. No detailed description of it uh, uh, survives, unfortunately, but according to a document of uh, 1814, uh, it comprised seven paintings and six sculptures. There has been much debate in recent years over the altarpiece's original appearance, but there is a considerable uh, consensus that it comprised five paintings today in the Prado. So here they are, but you have them here. The Annunciation, the Baptism of Christ, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, and, and the Pentecost that you that I think you, you, you had at the, at the Meadows a couple of years ago. And, and the sixth is supposed to be here, 
the, the adoration of the shepherd now in, in Bucharest. We don't know what happened to the, to the seventh painting. That's, that's, a, that's a great, that's a big question mark. Uh, and, but presumably, uh, it uh, represented the coronation of the Virgin. So why this set of paintings is probably the most ambitious altarpiece El Greco ever painted, it also clear, it's, it's also a clear announce of what his late style as an artist would become. Elongated figures, spatial incurrences, utterly dramatic light effects with glaring colors in the dark, and huge massive formats. It's actually very impressive to remember here whence he came and how fast and innovatively he moved from being a provincial icon painter to becoming one of the most original artists and certainly the last great master of the Renaissance. Then, um, for the last part of my talk, um, for we are about to reach the very end of El Greco's career, and life, I would like to explore the core of his creative process in both intellectual and technical terms and try to answer the key question about El Greco, the key question about what is really unique in El Greco or about El Greco and why does he still look like a modern artist to us. I strongly believe that above all it is his trajectory that is unique and makes him unique the overlapping layers of languages, cultures, ideas, and aspiration that it entailed, and his synthesis of them in his art. His process also centered around a persistent dynamic of invention and variation, which enabled him to pursue uh, his own creative ambitions. The terms invention and variation relate to the concept of originality in a very paradoxical way, actually. Invention necessarily implies originality, whereas variations, which presupposes repetition or derivation, might appear to roll it down or, at the very least, to undercut it. Nonetheless, in the case of El Greco, it is precisely the correlation of these two practices that explains the, remarkable, pro, the, sorry, the remarkably prolific and original vitality of his body of work, as well as his conception of painting and of the role of the artist. Even more interesting are the artist's many variations of certain compositional prototypes, a practice visible throughout his lengthy career. The iconography of St. Francis, for instance, you have it here, inspired him to pursue the greatest range of different solutions. We know 13 different solutions to represent St. Francis in El Greco's body of work. Since the beginning, during his period in Italy, in which he seemingly focused on small, form on, on small format compositions, he painted this subject at least three times. As was often the case in his early uh, career in Italy, he made use of, engra of engravings and the painting in the Accademia Carrara, so this one, uh, which seems to be the earliest and possibly dates from his to his time in Venice, harks back to a renowned word cut by Nicola Boldrini after Titian and actually to another, so for uh, for, for the global composition, uh, but actually to another um, um, engraving after Michelangelo for this very figure. In a small work at the Zulaga Foundation, the artist repeated the figure of his companion, Brother Leo. So this figure here, you can see exactly here but modify the scale of the characters and their spatial location and introduce a more direct sense of interaction between the saint and the viewer, having him cl looking toward the viewer and cl closer to us. A change in style accompanies this new, more effective approach to composition. While in the Bergamo version, we can already see the savage sense of nature and the menacing presence of the sky, in the Zuluaga picture, 
the landscape is clearly pervaded with a nervous tension that echoes the dynamic effect being pursued. A third variant, which has only been uh, rediscovered and recognized as El Greco's, offers us a focused view of a half-length figure, so this one. The close-up effect em emphasizes the same status as a Christ-like figure and increases the impact of the, uh, of the image by appealing to an emotional response. So it's very interesting to, 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 to see how El Greco moved from this painting to this painting, uh, on, only keeping this figure, and from this painting to this painting, focusing on this figure. So that's pretty much uh, his process to, um, well, to improve uh, the, the, the images he was creating at the time. The three early variants of St. Francis created while the artist was still in an experimental phase already demonstrate his determination to invent a distinctive and expressive style. They are also setting a process that he would follow all along his artistic life and I show you here some other examples. So one is obviously the example of St. Peter as you have the, the, the Bowes version which is the first version on view here uh, at, the, at the meadows. So it's very interesting to, 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 to track the, the changes he made from one painting to the other. So having the, the, the yellow cape of St. Peter on his shoulder here while he was on, 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 uh, on his legs here and the appearance of the keys that are missing here uh, and, the, and the blue uh, that became uh, quite brighter in the, in the, in the, in the second version. So this is the first version made, uh, the first version of this theme made in Toledo in the 80s uh, when he arrived. Then that is the first version of the second type of uh, St. Peter's interior. And that's the, the, not the final version, that's the best version of this second type of St. Peter's interiors. And th this one is, at the, um, is in the Phillips Collection in, in Washington, D.C. So it's very interesting, and, and it's, a, it's a clear, it's very interesting to study El Greco, studying I, the sequences he, he, he did, actually. Another very interesting sequence is the one for, uh, about Saint Magdalene. Here you have, uh, it's pretty much the same date of the Saint Peter in Tears from the Bose Museum you have here on view at, at the meadow. So it's still quite Venetian in style. Uh, uh, this one is the mid 80s, so it's, 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 it's a bit different and, and it's no more the, the, the saint being uh, in the process of her conversion. She is no totally converted and you see that she's also pretty much covered uh, in comparison to, to this first uh, invention. Also because the church um, uh, edicted a rule that the Saint Magdalene has to be uh, depicted, has to be represented, uh, totally covered and uh, un already converted to, 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 to the faith. So it's, uh, she is no more the sinner, she is, she is already the saint. Uh, but what is interesting is that from this version, which is the first version of the second type, uh, and this version, which is an autograph version at the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, uh, it looks like the same, but it's not the same. You, 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 you can notice that the, the rock here on the left moved to the right, that the cloud here is much more um, powerful, that the skull and, and the vase moved uh, to the right too. So it looks like the same, but it's not the same. And, and again, El Greco tried to, to improve uh, his uh, representation, his depiction of, uh, of uh, the, the repentant Saint Magdalene. One of the most fascinating variations uh, concer concerns El Soplon, or boy blowing on an amber. The theme harkens back to a lost painting by the ancient Greek artist Antiphidius. So obviously ancient Greek artist that, that appeared on, on El Greco. The light reveals a face to the same extent that it illuminates it. We can thus perceive the luminous, the luminous intensity to the same extent that one has the impression of hearing the expulsion of hair blown onto the flame in quite a cinematic way. It is indicative that the painting was dubbed El Soplon, a term that means in Spanish both blower and revealer 
of secrets. This theme came to occupy the painter in a series of variations. The sequence of the three expanded versions, you have them all here, uh, allows us to follow his process from both a technical and an, an intellectual point of view. In the first, so this is the one from Howard. Uh, in the first, El Greco elaborated the picture by adding two more figures. He constructed the composition with dynamic brush strokes, organizing it with a spatial architecture articulated and unified, unified by light. The daring second version is pure virtuoso painting. Here, having resolved the question of invention and composition, the artist focused on, uh, on an ethereal lighting effect, offering us a lesson in shadows. I think you can totally follow what is the first version and the autograph replica done by El Greco. So no more compositional issue, just, just painting. It's like, a, it's like a ghost of the, former, of the, of the, of the previous painting. So, the, um, finally, the last version, the third version, now at the Museo del Prado, uh, in this version he started over from scratch, rebuilding the image and reformulating his intention. The painting recovers its sense of structure, and the framing and the lighting are different. The insistent focus this time is on the faces, in particular the light blanched visage of the young man uh, in, the, in, the, in the center. The ver this version feels less descriptive and more psychologically penetrating. Through repetition then, El Greco freed himself of the ancient theme he was responding to and measuring himself against ultimately appropriating it and using it to reinvent, uh, to reinvent his work and his style. A similar evolution may perhaps be seen in the different versions of uh, Christ expelling the moneylenders from the temples. Uh, from the temple, sorry. A subject that occupied the artist until the last years of his life. El Greco moved from a taut, serried, brilliant narrative. This is the painting uh, from the uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington. To a monumental articulated and eloquent approach that responds to the style of painting practiced in Rome. This is the painting uh, from Minneapolis that we have seen already. References to ancient sculpture are numerous, as I said, including the Laocoon, the Farnese Hercules, and the Sleeping Ariadne. Alongside de this demonstration of style, El Greco also offered proof that he himself was capable of responding to the edicts of uh, the Council of Trent. As the artist himself demonstrated, Christ expelling the moneylenders from the temple is symbolic of the restoration of the church to proper order and the persecution of heresy. He may also have ventured to add uh, another signification, an uh, another self-referential dimension, at least it's my uh, intuition, uh, betrayed by the presence of half-length portrait uh, in the lower right-hand corner. You have here um, Titian, his great master uh, during his time in, in Venice. Uh, Michelangelo, his rival, even if he was dead, in, in, uh, in Rome. Giulio Clovio, his great friend uh, in, uh, in Italy and especially in Rome. And this figure probably is Raphael, who obviously had uh, already, uh, um, already uh, uh, was already dead when El Greco was in Rome, but still was a very important figure uh, in the papal city. Here again, uh, we clearly see El Greco's preoccupation with claiming, developing, and defending a lofty conception not only of art. Uh, and of the artist's role, but also, and relatedly, of a perfect style born of the proper union of colore and disegno, color and drawing. In order to incarnate the messianic figure of the artist that he thought himself to be, El Greco may have attempted to represent himself in imitation of Christ 
as the purifier or reformer of painting, we will rid it of various imposters. So El Greco, just like Christ, uh, cleansing the temple of, of art, cleansing the temple of painting. El Greco was a Renaissance painter who indeed believed in the almost divine power of invention and style. The latest version of the purification of the temple seems almost to encompass all of El Greco's career and evolution. I'll show you some uh, detail. The figure of Christ here relates indeed to an early drawing of his, a study after a Michelangelo sculpture. The tilted young man on the left, uh, sorry, here, is a rework of the yellow figure preparing the cross in the expolio. So you see, orange was the new yellow at the time. The sculpture then, in the background, echoes the style of El Greco's own work in this field. And even the architecture is reminiscent or, of his work. And actually, it's a faithful uh, quotation of an altarpiece, the artist design for the church of Ilescas. And to finish, the figure on the far left, waving his arms, already appeared in the dream of Philip II and would soon uh, resurface in the famous vision of uh, Saint John. Alpha and Omega. El Greco became his own reference, finding his sources and material in his own art, inventing, varying, and reinventing himself through variations. That was pretty much his creative drive, not far, I think, from the numerous version on Va of Van Gogh's haystacks, Cezanne Saint Victoire Hills, or Monet Water Lilies. More than his style, it is perhaps El Greco's approach to art that makes him a modern painter. With the late 19th century, 19th and, 20, and early 20th century uh, artist, he definitely shares two ambitions and challenges. One was to regenerate the style. For El Greco, it was about regenerating the style of the dying Renaissance. For the, the moderns and the avant-garde artists, it was uh, giving a new breath after one century of uh, breathless academism. The other challenge was to reinvent what an image was. For El Greco, it was after the Council of Trent and uh, the need of new images the church had. For someone like Picasso, it was reinventing an image after the invention of photography. For those artists, El Greco was not only a model, he was also a prophet, and certainly, over the centuries, an inspirational companion. And I indulge myself to think that he still is. Thank you. <laughs>